card games really appeal to a lot of people because it's uh, it's a sense of and uh, the evolution of the game. So you can buy some packs. It's fairly cheap to start. So you like you know like Magic has that whole uh, thing where people play pack wars, right? You can play Magic: The Gathering. People pull out a pack and they'll just like play out of that. But you can also make a deck with 40 cards. And you can play that against you know whomever. But if you're really into the format, you can really deep dive on a lot of different ways to play. And I I think that's kind of the value is you got a lot of options to play in different ways. And there's a lot of ways to extend the game so you can make it your own kind of style. Like in, again, in Magic the Gathering, people play uh, Canadian Highlander is, is a format where it's like a singleton format, 100 cards, but you can only have one of, of any card. You can't have multiples. Uh, and that leads to a completely different style of play and also makes it incredibly expensive. Uh, Keyforge is a unique deck game by Richard Garfield, who's the creator of Magic the Gathering. It actually uh, first launched last year around uh, last year's PAX Unplugged. Um, so each 36 card deck is completely unique um, and that's all you need to play, you just need one deck and um, players compete to uh, gather amber and you need six amber to forge a key. First player to forge three keys wins. I think that people put their time and money into, into a trading card game because it's like having any other kind of hobby. You're, you've, got, you've got some disposable income, you find something you enjoy doing, uh, there's an appeal in you know crafting something yourself, and some people like to, you know some people like to do woodworking. Some people like to you know do crochet and stuff. Some people like to work on their car. Um, people like to have hobbies, and TCGs are one of those things where it's like I have a set thing. I'm I'm building my own little chess set, and uh, I just you know this is a fun way for me to interact with other people and see how good I can get at doing a certain thing. And people just put in time to playing World of Warcraft too. There's nothing wrong with those kind of hobbies. Oh, uh, yeah, I actually would say that because, like, like every Sunday this year, not every Sunday, but, like, earlier on in the year, um, I've been, like, hosting, like, Commander games at my house, and he's been a big part of it. So he, he usually helps getting people to come because he's the ride. Like, so everybody gets to the house with him. But, uh, yeah, I, I buy the friendship. He's, he's got a lot of good cards. So, like, if I need something, I can just go through his binder and, like, probably take something there you know but like it's good it's good to have friends like that What got you interested in animation? Okay, uh, so in animation, um, it was because I wanted to tell my stories of Dungeons and Dragons online. And originally I had a blog where I just like retell the stories or talk about uh, RPGs and stuff. And people watch and it's kind of interesting, but it's like, you really didn't, I could tell people, it, it wasn't engaging with the audience as much. And so I started telling them online through the stories, but like they really needed a visual format. I think for like general attendees, uh, if they're not already into cosplay, can maybe like inspire them to want to try it out. Um, I think everyone should do one cosplay at least, um, because the 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 joy of like wearing a thing you made and having people say that it looks really good, and then you get to say, "Oh, thank you," and then they're excited because it's a character that they like too. Um, and for the general con, I just think it adds like a fun layer of like play uh, and sort of. I don't know, and whimsy, I guess. Um, and especially cons like this, where you can like meet the creators because uh, they're doing a lot of signings and things. Then you get to sort of thank them uh, by showing, you know, these people that are making the shows and things that we all love uh, what you were inspired to make based on their work. So, what's your fighter's name? Um, Kirk. So you're Kirk. And basically, as Kirk, you're particularly good against monsters, but you can gauge anything. Which do you think Kirk would go against? Uh, I was always interested in game design from when I was probably about eight or nine. Uh, I loved games in general, and I got the early D&D books. 
and I just basically both loved games and realized someone has a job. Someone made this book that I'm holding. I could have that job. I'm best known for creating uh, the world of Eberron for Dungeons and Dragons, and I've done a lot of role-playing uh, work uh, over the years. Then we made Action Cats and Action Pups, which are very sort of casual, fun family games about telling silly stories about cats and dogs. Uh, and then we also made Illimath with the band The Decemberists, which is a sort of classic card game that we wanted to feel like it's like a hundred years old and people have just forgotten about it. So they're quite different, but to us the sort of overriding theme is that we want games that bring people together, that you know people are having fun and telling stories with. Uh, on the other hand, something like the Adventure Zone that has more moving pieces, there we've done uh, a bunch of events where we've had, you know, 40 people playing at once. The first thing for us is you want to really think about what are the defining elements of the property. You know, what is it that the audience expects and wants? And how you're doing that, and then you've got to combine that with, okay, but what makes a compelling game experience? It doesn't have to appeal to everyone as long as it's going to appeal to enough people to make it successful for you. So this is Record, it's a guitar themed Euro game. Um, similar to games like Ticket to Ride or um, you know, even Catan is somewhat Euro-esque. Um, we make our own style of games in general. Um, we work on a lot of different uh, prototypes and then we'll take those out and test them at like proto spiels or different types of um, you know, prototyping events. Uh, there's a bunch of them like Unpub and, and Proto Spiel is another really good circuit. So we'll go out and test them and based on that feedback we kind of decide, oh well this one seems like people are really enjoying it, let's start working on this one. Or other ones maybe what are the problems we're having with them, let's start fixing those. Um, so I would say we probably went through about 15 iterations of like the board um, and, and just constant evolutions to the rules. It was just a lot of testing it and realizing that people do not necessarily know what a fretboard is, A, or how to manage this space uh, or the spatial orientation between frets and things. Um, in general, ideas are very, very abundant. Um, execution is what makes the difference of you know, whether you're going to be able to do it. So a lot of times we hear people that are worried about somebody's going to try and take my game. I always sort of share the thought experiment. What if you were trying to get your game taken? Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to sell games. That's, yeah, so, yeah. yeah that's it. Going back all the way to the very beginning, shall we say, um, we were approached to do a Witcher TRPG by CDPR because we're, of course, you know, working with them on 277. Um, and uh, we decided to go ahead with that. Um, and I set up a whole pitch for the uh, for the situation. This big like green binder that was basically the entire core system for the game. I went over and pitched that, and uh, I had this long, <laughs> heavily stressful pitch meeting that uh, eventually got to the end of it. You know, we we had a deal, and that was the beginning. Everything after that was uh, five to six years of. of game design and iteration, going in every day and, you know, taking copious notes on the Witcher novels and the video games and any bit of lore that we could scrape up from anything that was considered within our canon. And then sort of condensing all those notes into a cohesive game as best as possible, you know, writing rules, testing those rules, going back saying, you know, do they fit with the world of the Witcher? Does this feel like the world of the Witcher? And yes we move forward if it isn't we go back and we rewrite um, and you know that was most of it it was just day after day of you know trying to translate this uh, trying to translate mediums and then going back and rewriting where necessary I think there is uh, you know a, a lot of people have noted and we always note uh, between us and CDPR that there's a big sort of thematic connection between Witcher and Cyberpunk. Um, both of them are very personal stories that do not shy away from making hard decisions and showing that actions have consequences. And I think that makes them, while they're not everybody's cup of tea, it makes them in some ways more relatable to a lot of people because it is usually a more grounded story. It's, it's you know, it's not necessarily going out and saving the world or, you know, 
going out and doing grand world sweeping things. It's, you know, fighting to survive and fighting to make your life better and help you, the people around you, your family and your friends and things like that. So I think, you know, the, the heavily personal nature of both Witcher and Cyberpunk, I think make them not just interesting for people, but they resonate well with people.